the owl. So, the spear Danes in days gone by, and the kings who ruled them had courage and greatness. We have heard of those princes' heroic campaigns. There were shield chiefs and scourge of many tribes, a record of mead benches, rampaging among foes. This terror of the hall troops had come far, a foundling to start with, he would flourish later on, as his powers waxed and his youth was proved, and his worth was proved. In the end, each clan on the outlying coasts beyond the whale road had to yield to him and begin to pay tribute. That was one good king. Afterward, a boy child was born to shield, a cub in the yard, a comfort sent by God to that nation. He knew what they had told, the long times and troubles they had come through without a leader. So the Lord of life, the glorious Almighty, made this man renowned. Shield had fathered a famous son. Biao's name was known through the north, and a young prince must be prudent like that, giving freely while his father lives, so that afterward in age when fighting starts, steadfast companions will stand by him and hold the line. Behavior that's admired is the path to power among people everywhere. Shield was still thriving when this when his time came, and he crossed over into the Lord's keeping. His warrior band did what he bade them when he laid down the law among the Danes. They shouldered him out to the sea's flood, the chief they revered who had long ruled them. A ring whirled prow rode in the harbor, ice-clad outbound a craft for a prince. They stretched their beloved lord in his boat, laid out by the mast amidships, the great ring-giver. Far-fetched treasures were piled upon him, and precious gear. I never heard before of a ship so well furbished, with battle tackle, bladed weapons, and coats of mail. The masked treasure was loaded on top of him. It would travel far, on out into the ocean's sway. They decked his body no less bountifully, with offerings than those first ones did, who cast him away when he was a child and launched him alone out over the waves. And they set a gold standard up, high above his head, and let him drift, to wind and tide, bewailing him, and mourning their loss. No man can tell, no wise man in hall or weathered veteran, knows for certain who salvaged that load. Then it fell to bow to keep the forts. He was well regarded and ruled the Danes for a long time after his father took leave of his life on earth. And then his heir, the great half-Dane, held sway for as long as he lived, their elder and warlord. He was four times a father, this fighter prince. One by one they entered the world. Herogar, Hrothgar, the good Halga, and a daughter, I have heard, who was Onella's queen a balm in bed to the battle-scarred Swede. The fortunes of war favored Hrothgar. Friends and kinsmen flocked to his rank, ranks, young followers, a force that grew to be a mighty army. So his mind turned to hall building. He handed down orders for men to work on a great mead hall, meant to be a wonder of the world forever. It would be his throne room, and there he would dispense his God-given goods to young and old, but not the common land or people's lives. Far and wide through the world, I have heard, orders for work to adorn that wallstead were sent to many peoples, and soon it stood there, finished and ready, in full view, the hall of halls. Herat was the name he had settled on, whose utterance was law, nor did he renege, but doled out rings and torques at the table. The hall towered, its gables wide and high and waiting, and awaiting a barbarous burning. That room abided, but in time it would come. The killer instinct unleashed among in-laws the bloodlust rampant. Herod is attacked. Then a powerful demon, a prowler through the dark, Nursed a hard grievance, 
It harrowed him to hear the din of the loud banquet every day in the hall, the harp being struck and the clear song of a skilled poet telling with mastery of man's beginnings how the Almighty had made the earth a gleaming plain girdled with waters. In his splendor he set the sun and the moon to be earth's lamplight, lanterns for men, and filled the broad lap of the world with branches and leaves, and quickened life and every other thing that moved. So times were pleasant for the people there, until finally one, a fiend out of hell, began to work his evil in the world. Grendel was the name of this grim demon, haunting the marshes, marauding round the heath, and the desolate fens. He had dwelt for a time in misery among the banished monsters, Cain's clan whom the Creator had outlawed, and condemned as outcasts, for the killing of Abel, the eternal Lord had exacted a price. Cain got no good from committing that murder, because the Almighty had given, had made him anathema, and out of the curse of his exile there sprang ogres and elves and evil phantoms, and the giants too who strove with God, time and again until he gave them their reward. So, after nightfall, Grendel set out for the lofty house to see how the ring Danes were settled into it after their drink, and there he came upon them, a company of the best, asleep from their feasting, insensible to pain and human sorrow. Suddenly then, the god-cursed brute was creating havoc. Greedy and grim, he grabbed thirty men from the resting places and rushed to his lair. Flushed up and inflamed from the raid, blundering back with the butchered corpses. Then as dawn brightened and the day broke, Grendel's powers of destruction were plain. Their sail was over. They, kept, they wept to heaven and mourned under mourning. Their mighty prince, the story leader, sat stricken and helpless, humiliated by the loss of his guard, bewildered and stunned, staring aghast at the demon's trail in deep distress. He was numb with grief but got no respite, for one night later merciless Grendel struck again with more gruesome murders. Malignant by nature, he never showed remorse. It was easy then to meet with a man shifting himself to a safer distance, to bed in the bothies, to bed in the bothies, for who could be blind to the evidence of his eyes, the obviousness of the hall watcher's hate. Whoever escaped kept a wealth weather eye open and moved away. So Grendel ruled in defiance of right, one against all until the greatest house in the world stood empty, a deserted wallstead. For twelve winters, seasons of woe, the lord of the shielding suffered under his load of sorrow, and so before long, the news was known over the whole world. Sad lays are sung about the beset king, the vicious raids and ravages of Grendel, his long and unrelenting feud, nothing but war, how he would never parley, parley or make peace with any Dane, nor stop his death dealing or pay the death price. No counselor could ever expect fair reparation from those rabid hands. All were endangered, young and old, were hunted down by that dark death shadow, who lurked and swooped in the long nights on the misty moors. Nobody knows where these reavers from hell roam and on their errands. So Grendel waged his lonely war, inflicting constant cruelties on the people, atrocious hurt. He took over Herot, haunted the glittering hall after dark, but the throne itself, the treasure seat, he was kept from approaching. He was the Lord's outcast. These were hard times, heartbreaking, for the Prince of the Shieldings, powerful counselors, the highest in the land would lend advice, plotting how best the bold defenders might resist and beat off sudden attacks. Sometimes at pagan shrines they vowed, offering to idols, swore oaths, that the killer of souls might come to their aid and save the people. That was their way, their heathenish hope. Deep in their hearts they remembered hell. The Almighty Judge of good deeds and bad, the Lord God, Head of the Heavens and High King of the World, was unknown to them. 
O oh, cursed is he who in time of trouble has to thrust his soul in the fire's embrace, forfeiting help. He has nowhere to turn, but blessed is he who after death can approach the Lord and find friendship in the Father's embrace. The hero comes to Herat. Herat. So that troubled time continued, woe, that never stopped, steady affliction. For half Dane's son, too hard an ordeal, there was panic after dark. People endured raids in the night, driven by the terror. When you heard about Grendel, Hyglak's Thane, Thane was on home ground over in Geatland. There was no one else like him alive. In his day, he was the mightiest man on earth. High born and powerful, he ordered a boat that would ply the waves. He announced his plan to sail the Swan's Road and seek out that king, the famous prince who needed defenders. Nobody tried to keep him from going, no elder denied, denied him, dear as he was to them. Instead, they inspected omens and spurred his ambition to go, whilst he moved about like the leader he was, enlisting men the best he could find. With fourteen others, the warrior boarded the boat as captain, a canny pilot along coasts and currents. Time went by, the boat was on water, in clothes under the cliffs. Men climbed eagerly up the gangplank. Sand churned and surfed, warriors loaded a cargo of weapons, shining war gear in the vessel's hold, then heaved out away with a will in their wood-wreathed ship. Over the waves with the wind behind her and foam at her neck, she flew like a bird until her curved prow had covered the distance, and on the following day at the due hour, those seafarers sighted land, sunlit cliffs, sheer crags, and looming headlands, the landfall they had sought. It was the end of their voyage, and the geats vaulted over the side, out onto the, out onto the sand, and moored their ship. There was a clash of mail and a thresh of gear. They thanked God for that easy crossing on a calm sea. When the watchman on the wall, the shielding's lookout, whose job it was to guard the sea cliffs, saw shields glittering on the gangplank and battle equipment being unloaded, he had to find out who and what the arrivals were. So he rode to the shore, this horseman of Fothgar's, and challenged them in formal terms, flourishing his spear. What kind of men are you who arrive? Rigged out for combat in your coats of mail, sailing here over the sea lanes in your steep-hauled boat. I have long been state I have been stationed as lookout on this coast for a long time. My job is to watch the waves for raiders, any danger to the Danish shore. Never before has a force under arms disembarked so openly, not bothering to ask if the sentries allowed them safe passage or the clan had consented. Nor have I seen a mightier man at arms on this earth than the one standing here. Unless I am mistaken, he is truly noble. There is no more hanger-on in a hero's armor. So now, before you fare inland as interlopers, I have to be informed about who you are and where you hail from. Outside from across the water, I say it again. The sooner you tell where you come from and why, the better. The leader of the troop unlocked his, wood, his word hoard. The distinguished one delivered this answer. We belong by birth to the Geat people, and owe allegiance to the Lord Hyjlak. In his day my father was a famous man, a noble warrior lord named Ekthiao. Ek he outlasted many a long winter and went on his way. All over the world men wise in council continue to remember him. We come in good faith to find your lord and nation's shield, the son of Halfdane. Give us the right advice and direction. We have arrived here on a great errand to the Lord of the Danes, and I believe, therefore, there should be nothing hidden or withheld between us. So tell us if what we have heard is true about this threat, whatever it is, this danger abroad in the dark nights, this corpse-maker mongering death in the shielding's country. I come to proffer my wholehearted help and counsel. I can show the wise Hrothgar away to defeat his enemy and find respite. If any respite is to reach him, ever, I can qualm the turmoil and terror in his mind. 
Otherwise he must endure woes, and live with the grief for as long as his hall stands at the horizon on its high ground. Undaunted, sitting astride his horse, the coast guard answered, Anyone with gumption and a sharp mind will take the measure of two things, what's said and what's done. I believe what you have told me, that you are a troop, loyal to our king. So come ahead with your arms and your gear, and I will guide you. What's more, I'll order my own comrades, on their word of honor, to watch your boat, down there on the strand. Keep her safe, in her fresh tar, until the time comes for her curved prow to preen on the waves, and bear this hero back to Geatland. May one so valiant and venturesome come unharmed through the clash of battle. So they went on their way. The ship rode the water, broad beamed bound by its hawser, and anchored fast. Boar shapes flashed above their cheek guards, the brightly forged work of goldsmiths watching over those stern faced men. They marched in step, hurrying on till the timbered hall rose before them, radiant with gold. Nobody on earth knew of another building like it. Majesty lodged there, its light shone over many lands. So their gallant escort guided them to that dazzling stronghold and indicated the shortest way to it. Then the noble warrior wheeled on his horse and spoke these words. It is time for me to go. May the Almighty Father keep you and in his kindness. Watch over your exploits. I'm away to the sea, back on alert against enemy raiders. It was a paved track, a path that kept them in marching order. Their mail shirts glinted, hard and hand-linked. The high-gloss iron of their armor rang. So they duly, duly arrived in their grim war, war grave, and gear at the hall and, weary from the sea, stacked wide shields of the toughest hardwood against the wall. Then collapsed on the benches, battle dress and weapons clashed. They collected their spears and a seafarer's stook, a stand of grayish, tapering ash. And the troops themselves were as good as their weapons. Then a proud warrior questioned the men concerning their origins. Where do you come from, carrying these decorated shields and shirts of mail? these cheek-hinged helmets and javelins. I am Hrothgar's herald and officer. I've never seen so impressive or large an assembly of strangers. Stoutness of heart, bravery, not banishment, must have brought you to Hrothgar. The man whose name was known for courage, the Geat leader, resolute in his helmet, answered in return. We are retainers from Hyjlak's band. Beowulf is my name. If your lord and master, the most renowned son of Halfdane, will hear me out and graciously allow me to meet him in person, I am ready and willing to report my errand. Wolfgar replied, a Wendell chief, renowned as a warrior, well known for his wisdom and the temper of his mind. I will take this message in accordance with your wish to our noble king, our dear lord, friend of the Danes, the giver of rings. I will go and ask him about your coming here, then hurry back with whatever reply it pleases him to give. With that he turned to where Hrothgar sat, an old man among retainers. The valiant follower stood four square in front of his king. He knew the courtesies. Wolfgar addressed his dear lord. People from Geatland have put ashore. They have sailed far over the wide sea. They call the chief in charge of their band by the name of Beowulf. They beg, my lord, an audience with you, exchange of words and formal greeting. Most gracious Hrothgar, do not refuse them, but grant them a reply. From their arms and disappointment they appear well-born and worthy of respect, especially the one who has led them this far. He is, a formid he is formidable indeed. Hrothgar, protector of shieldings, replied, I used to know him when he was a young boy. His father before him was called Ekthio. Preth Prethel the Geat gave Ekthau his daughter in marriage. This man is their son, here to follow up an old friendship. A crew of seamen who sailed for me once with a gift cargo across the Geatland 
returned with marvelous tales about him. A thane, they declared, with the strength of thirty in the grip of each hand. Now, holy God, has, in his goodness, guided him here to the West Danes to defend us from Grendel. This is my hope, and for his heroism I will re recomp recompense him with a rich treasure. Go immediately, bid him and the Geats he has in attendance to assemble and enter. Say moreover, when you speak to them, they are welcome to Denmark. At the door of the hall, Wolfgar duly delivered the message. My lord, the conquering king of the Danes, bids me announce that he knows your ancestry, also that he welcomes you here to Herat, and salutes your arrival from across the sea. You are free now to move forward to meet Hrothgar in helmets and armor, but shields must stay here and spears be stacked until the outcome of the audience is clear. The hero arose, surrounded closely by his powerful thanes. A party remained under the orders to keep watch on the arms. The rest proceeded, led by their prince, under Herod's wolf, Herod's roof. And standing on the hearth, in webbed links that the smith had woven, the fine forged mesh of his gleaming mail shirt, resolute in his helmet, the owl wolf spoke. Greetings to Rothgar. I am Hyjlak's kinsman, one of his hall troop. When I was younger, I had great triumph. Then news of Grendel, hard to ignore, reached me at home. Sailors brought stories of the plight you suffer in this legendary hall, how it lies deserted, empty, and useless once the evening light hides itself under, the he under heaven's dome. So elder and experienced counsel so every elder and experienced councilman among my people supported my resolve to come here to you, King Hrothgar, because all knew of my awesome strength. They had seen me boltered in the blood of enemies when I battled and bound five beasts, railed a troll's net a troll nest, and in the night in the night sea slaughtered sea brutes. I have suffered extremes and avenged the Geats. Their enemies brought it upon themselves. I devastated them. Now I mean to be a match for Grendel. Settle the outcome in single combat. And so my request, O King of Bright Danes, dear Prince of the Shieldings, friend of the people, and the Ring of Defense, my one request is that you won't refuse me, who have come this far, the privilege of purifying Herod, with my own men to help me and nobody else. I have heard moreover that this mon that the monster scorns in his reckless way to use.